It's so much fun to say, let the party begin. Some of you, uh, as the tradition, began it early. And welcome to this book signing event by, hosted by Acadian House Publishing here in Lafayette. My name is Joe Paris. I'll be your master of ceremonies for the night, for what that's worth. And it's worth every penny you've paid for it. <laughs> but I want to tell you that tonight we're going to recognize those who helped put the story together. And as you already know, we have complimentary wine and beer, the hardest stuff you can get in the bar, and we're grateful to Ruth Chris to opening up the bar for that reason. But wine and beer are provided free for you here tonight, as are the, the appetizers. And if it whets your appetite but doesn't uh, completely satisfy it, of course, you're welcome to stay for dinner. But, of course, that would be on your nickel, but we have lots of appetizers here tonight for you. As you know, a story like this gets put together by many people. And, you know, you're lucky if you grew up in Acadiana or South Louisiana, because you are better prepared for any natural disaster that might come along because you've had to face them so often as you grew up. Now, most of us learned a few things, I know I did growing up in Crowley, about dealing with natural disasters that today's event illustrates beautifully. You know, one of the things I know I learned is that when nature's fury tries to get the better of us, that's the time to call upon the better angels of our nature in order to calm that fury, not only for ourselves, which is the first natural instinct, but for others. And this is what Doug and Drew did. They didn't think just of themselves. And that was, is what this story is about, because these two people went against the tide, literally, and mostly behaved like the animal I have on my tie, a rhinoceros, in the sense that they were single-minded, nothing was going to stop them, and don't you get in their way? Because they focused their energies and their efforts on helping other people. And the other lesson of this is that sometimes it's necessary to ignore normal orders, because that's the only way to fix things even when being told no, you go around that and it doesn't have to be the end to your effort. And like I said, there are many efforts that help put this story together. And I'd like to recognize those who assisted the author in the creation of this permanent printed book. John Russo, graphic design and production. Where's John? Over here. The man in black. Don Fields, map making and photography. Where's Mr. Fields? Not here. Not here, okay. Kim Crable, just out of my line of sight, but I think Kim is in the Vermilion Velvet over here. She did accounting and administration. William Kalick, interviewing and editing. Where's William? There he is over there. Darlene Smith of the Academy of the Sacred Heart in Grand Catote was the co-editor and proofreader. Where's Miss Smith? Six feet tall and easy to see in the back. <laughs> Matt Absher is the proof, another proofreader. Where's Mr. Absher? Matthew. Kevin Pontiff, who illustrated the back cover. Where's Mr. Pontiff? Right there. All of these people, of course, put themselves together to make sure this experience was recorded. But you know, no experience is complete until the complete story is told. And that's where our author comes in. This gentleman was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you know what they say about the second time, huh? The first time could have been a crazy notion, but the second time there must be something there. This young man is about to enter his fifth decade as a service as a storyteller of the Acadian way of life in Louisiana. He's the author of five books and a veteran journalist of 40 plus years of service as a journalist. And he's been a magazine editor of Acadiana Profile for the last third of a century. I give you the author of an airboat on the streets of New Orleans, Trent Andrews. Be seated, and I intend to do that. 
Uh, I have a few people I need to introduce as well, and we're going to show a very short clip from television of about two to three minutes. Uh, but I want to say that uh, this book is about two, to me, really extraordinary real-life heroes from St. Martin Parish that really did the parish proud and really did our state proud. Uh, this story is one of the, to me, one of the most heroic things I've heard in years. And it's not my original idea, it's the original idea of the Tesh News. And uh, I, we get the Tesh News at Acadiana Profile, we exchange subscriptions. and. Um, I saw the story and I saw this guy in a, a, a t-shirt, um, an airboat, and, and this a group of uh, really bedraggled, tired-looking people who were in the process of saving other people who were even more bedraggled and more tired. Um, but they rescued certainly more than 500 people, maybe more than 700 people. It was an extraordinary effort, a labor of love, an act of compassion for one's fellow man. That, that went completely uncompensated and practically unrecognized. So I, I'm thinking, is there a way that, that the world should not know this story? And I'm thinking, no, uh, I'm going to spend a little time on it. So I spent about 1,200 hours over two and a half years uh, interviewing and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing Doug and Drew and researching and talking to people whose lives they saved. Among those they saved were some old, a couple of old men in wheelchairs paralyzed from the waist down, in water, up to their necks, the water still coming up. Had Doug been a patient person and uh, dazzled, by the voices of, uh, dazzled by the voices of authority, which he never was in the past, and I would predict will never be in the future, uh, had he waited and, and sat aside like the authority said, th this man that I'm talking about would have drowned because the water was still coming up. This was day one. This was Doug and them saying, it's, we got to hit the beach and we got to hit the beach now. And Drew says, I'm in. So they saved that sort of people. They saved a woman with a gunshot wound who was in extreme pain and bleeding and uh, we're not really sure whether she ultimately made it, but that's another one. But the most heartwarming story that I found out, mm -hmm. and I got this in bits and pieces uh, from talking to Doug yeah. and Drew, um, they were working up and down South Claiborne Avenue, picking up people out of the water, saving them, and it was twilight, and it was time to go home because you can't run an airboat in the dark. I'm in the middle of a meeting. But thank you. You cannot run an airboat in the dark. Um, and so they're heading on home, and the streets that feed into South Claiborne Avenue um, are dark anyway because of the heavy canopy of oak trees. And so Drew, I don't know if she heard it or she, she couldn't have seen it. I think she sensed it, that there was somebody in dire need on a street on the side. And she said, Doug, kill the boat. And of course, Doug obeys. He kills the boat. <laughs> um, and so they hear a faint the crowd. sound. And there are two people coming in the water, four feet of water, five feet of water. And they're holding up a baby. And they move, over, Doug and Drew move the airboat over to these people, and it's a dad holding up a baby, and a mom who is, who is, um, you know, doing this, uh, wait, excuse me, I think that somebody needs to get in this door behind y'all. Could you give them a little, <laughs> they're trying to get Just point the other door? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the man is holding up the baby over his head, the woman is, is, begging and screaming and waving her arms and and so they bring the airboat over and lo and behold the baby has asthma the baby can't breathe the parents have waited out of a they're in the process of waiting out of a complete nightmare but into another nightmare because the water was dark and dirty and filthy and bacteria laden they had to leave the home which they had spent their lives building and, and financing i'm sure and besides having lost everything they're about to lose the life of their baby. So they desperately head practically in the dark towards South Claiborne Avenue and uh, they're rescued by these two angels who, angels of light who showed up. Now are there those who would say, we know Doug Bienvenu and he's not an angel. <laughs> Amen! <laughs> Do I have a second to that? <laughs> we have an entire chorus who is going to testify to but at any rate, um, uh, these are just a couple of the heartwarming stories. The baby eventually was saved, but had it not been for Drew's instinct 
and Doug's airboat, um, that it's doubtful that the baby would have lived. Moreover, the terror that the parents felt like waiting in the dark, you're not sure where you're going, and that could have been snakes or alligators or rats or Lord knows what in the water, and uh, they, they, they were plucked from the water by these two guys from St. Martin Parish. Anyway, um, but to continue, uh, I want to say that that um, we have a brief clip for about two to three minutes that I want to show you. And so if you'll come with me back to August of 2005, back to New Orleans, into the floodwaters, see what Doug and Drew saw 